I'm Benjamin, the intrepid and self-effacing and humble participant in today's um, conversation. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Why do some Mormons leave the LDS Church? A lot of us think we know, but Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll have put together the largest survey of ex-Mormons ever done, and it's a scientific poll. So we'll find out more about these results, about what makes it uncomfortable for certain people, so much so that they choose to leave the church. This is a conversation you're not going to want to miss. Check out our conversation. Hey, by the way, this is the last time to sign up for the... Um, a copy of Jana and Ben's book here, The Next Mormons. I'm going to give away a copy to one of our newsletter subscribers. You can subscribe for free at gospeltangents.com newsletter, and I'll be drawing a winner in our next conversation. So you're not going to want to miss that. So please, if you'd like a, co a free copy of Jana and Ben's book, um, I'll be drawing that in our next conversation. Check it out. Now back to our conversation. So the last question I wanted to ask you guys uh, was about former Mormons, because I think that's really interesting. You guys had a pretty good sized sample of, of former Mormons, and how are they different than, um, than the regular Mormons, I guess? Well, methodologically, I, I'm grateful that you said we had a pretty good sized sample. The, me the margin of error is higher because mm -hmm. there are only 540 people in it. The other thing that I would say about the former Mormon research is that unlike all of this data that we have, previous data about current Mormons, we have far less about former Mormons. We don't have those benchmarks that we really are very sure about. And so it's a bit more like the Wild West. Um, so take this with more caution, I would say, than the certainty that we can, the greater degree of certainty that we can have with some of the current Sure, Mormons. absolutely. We tried to benchmark it to the demographic categories as such to see how representative it was based on the Pew survey, but even then they've got two or 300 yeah. in that 35,000 uh, survey there. So it's small, high margin of error, but like looking at it there, using it as a rough estimate, we, the, the survey that we collected was perhaps not perfectly, but roughly in line there. But everything Jenna said, yes, absolutely. It's right. two and a half so, times bigger than, than Pew's. So correct. That's pretty mm -hmm. awesome, I'd yeah. say. And I know John DeLynn did a, <clears throat> did a survey a while back. Were, were your results similar to his? or Not at all. And I want to point out that um, this is part of the difference between you know, a nationally representative survey, survey and a sample that is of a targeted population. And um, their study, which is uh, really helpful and interesting and well done, they would be the first to tell you, I think, that it's not a nationally representative sample of all former Mormons. And if you look in the... In the um, really helpful breakdown of who was in that study. They have a very affluent population and a very well-educated population. And so the fact that what they're finding is that these people are very interested in history and they're very interested in some of these more controversial issues about Mormon theology, well, in part that is because this is a very affluent and well-educated population. And in part it's because this is a population that has been fielded through social media affinity groups that are interested in those questions, right? So it's a self-selecting sample, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. That does not mean that it's not valuable for understanding that important population, but it's not generalizable to everyone. Okay. And then in contrast, so what we were able to get is, um, and, th and that was good, just like what Jenna was saying, to, to, to get it at certain populations, specifically the ones who are super active, and then not, and trying to understand how they think. This one includes some of those people, ones who are super active and then suddenly something happened and then not. But it also includes people who were 11 years old when their family converted and then by the time they were 15 they kind of dropped out again. Our median like, age for leaving yeah. was 19. Yeah. And according to that leak church uh, information that they I think did not ever want to be public but is available on YouTube, um, they're looking at loss of activity around age 20. So I think ours is, is pretty similar actually to what the church is, is seeing. You said numbers. that the loss of activity is around 19 in your survey? Our median age of, of se losing that self-identification was 19. They may have been going inactive for a while before that. Okay. In fact, uh, we have a very interesting question. We just asked question. them, yeah, like yeah. how old are you now? About how old were you when you 
uh, was it disaffiliated or well, and how long, or something? How long yeah. was that process? Yeah. You know? And in, for most people, it was more than six months. This is not a rash decision that people are making because they suddenly go to church one day and they get offended by something that somebody says. You know, it sounds like for the majority of people, this is something that builds over a period of time. Well, and I know that's a narrative that really frustrates former Mormons is, oh, you quit because you, you wanted to sin and that sort of thing. What, what are the reasons? We, we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but let's dig a little deeper on that. What are some of the reasons that people choose dis to disaffiliate? I suppose the first thing to uh, clarify is we've got information amongst those who chose to disaffiliate for specific reasons that aren't necessarily just simply life cycle adolescent mm -hmm. disaffiliation, which is the biggest, that's the, that's, that's the biggest right one. There. The biggest yeah. one is just, well, I'm it's a just, teenager, not a This is church. what people in America and Europe do when they're teenagers, they tend to just... Right, or young yeah, adults. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And so a lot of former Mormons are in that same category. They're people who just for one reason or another just weren't that interested anymore. Church and then, is boring. Yeah, went on to do other things. Some of them rejoined a church later, some didn't. And we've got some information in the survey about like what are the lives of former Mormons like. Um, the ones who leave for these historical doctrinal issues tend to have um, a former Mormon life that's a little bit different than those who just leave because they just went inactive when they were teenagers, got married to someone who's not a member that never really went anymore because their family's diverse. So it's important that we just say, just like within the Mormon community, there are different you know groups of people and diversity and how it's expressed. Same thing with, with former members as well. So you mentioned this idea that you know, people just wanted to sin. Mm -hmm. That's one of the narratives that we hear sometimes. Well, they, start, they uh, studied more. too much church history. I, I get that a lot. <laughs> I wonder what, what the right amount of church history might be. Like, what's we'll that sweet spot? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Or we'll don't say things in. in Sunday school. I think that's another important um, thing. Right. So th there's the narrative about sinning, and there's also the narrative that uh, people had a negative experience of some kind, that they felt you know, angry about something that happened. And those actually did rank somewhat in our survey. So the, the issue of I engaged in behaviors that the church views as sinful ranked sixth overall out of 30 possible reasons for leaving. And the I was hurt by a negative experience ranked 11th, also much higher, was I felt judged or misunderstood, which is related, I think, which ranked fourth overall for all men and women, ranked first for women, and tied for first with millennials. So this issue of, of judgment is real. Um, I think that the way the church presents those narratives always puts the blame on the people who left. You know, so they they got offended. That was a choice that they made to get offended, and then they left, rather than thinking about what might have other people in the church, what might have they said or done that helped people feel that they were being judged and you know, not totally, totally absolve them from that responsibility. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you're saying the church could be a little more introspective with regards to especially judging people. Is that, is that yeah. what you're saying? I, I had a very, I think, rational and, and uh, even keeled temper tantrum one day in gospel doctrine class a couple years ago. And it was this lesson that you might remember about the, the pint of cream, oh. uh, the seat at the Kirtland Temple John dedication. Hamer has an article about that. Does he? <laughs> yes. Good, good. And he um, says that every year it gets, he, he gets a lot of hits because that lesson keeps coming up. <laughs> right. Well, for a while, when we were using that four-year cycle, you know, that Kirtland apostasy lesson would come up every fourth year. When it came up this last time, I was in Gospel Doctrine and I had some research. For the first time, oh, like nice. actually, let's talk about this. You know, it's, it's you came not... prepared. <laughs> actually, no, I didn't know it was going to be taught because oh. I'm I'm never that person who prepares in advance when I'm just the person sitting in the classroom. But uh, but this is something I've been thinking about a lot, and I said it's really convenient. It's just overly convenient that all of the reasons that are in this lesson are not about the people who are sitting right here. It's all about the people who aren't here and how we can judge them for not being here. Doesn't that feel great? You know, shouldn't we just all be patting ourselves on the back for being the ones who are not apostatizing and are still sitting here, you know? Like, oh, <laughs> maybe there is more to the story, yeah. Well, you definitely need to read John Hamer's uh, The Milk Stripping okay. Story. It's, it's, yes. it's awesome, so. 
Yeah. He, he gives a lot well, of history. And I, I'll, right. I was going to say, I mean, even the examples that are given in the lesson are more complicated historically than the lesson was preparing them or presenting them as. You know, it's never just one little isolated incident. Easier to teach when it's simple, though. <laughs> of course it is. It's true. Of course it is. Yeah. So, I mean, do you have any suggestions for, for some of these things? Or, or were you going to give us some more there? Uh, what are the big reasons why people are leaving? Um, I could talk about the, I guess, the politics and society angle right, good. a little bit. Right, yeah. um, Politics is your thing. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, so this here, this is one of a list of things that have been going on. So I want to preface this with this isn't the only reason. This is one of a variety of ones that we've identified and that other sociologists have identified in terms of explaining religious affiliation and disaffiliation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so with this one, this is something that's not necessarily something the church got started, but they're part of, kind of like what we were saying, part of the buffets of the things that have been going on. Um, and that has to do with the political polarization of American society over the last half century, but as well as its effect on the religious landscape as well. So it's no surprise we see all over the place uh, American political polarization, just in terms of people being very strongly in one camp or another, very strong identities. Um, with very divergent sets of ideological values, political values, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that same thing, though, has also been going on in the American religious landscape. Uh, it used to be 50 years ago that the biggest divisions in American religion, are you Protestant, or are you Catholic, or Jewish? Like, that was, that's, that's was your division, right? And that's how it influenced uh, political identities and voter behavior as well. Protestants voted for Republicans, Catholics voted for Democrats, you know, that that's what you looked at, what group are you in? Starting in the 80s with the rise of the religious right and as a reaction to a lot of the stuff that happened in the 60s and 70s, there was a reshuffling of those things to where the group identity mattered less than one's activity and belief orthodoxy within the group. Mm -hmm. And that shifted over time to now, it's the people who are very active, church-going, orthodox, literalist believers of their faith traditions are voting Republican, and those who go a little bit less or not at all, or who are more uh, metaphorical in their interpretation of doctrine, tend to align more with the Democratic Party. So now, very active Orthodox Catholics and very active Orthodox um, Evangelical Baptists have more in common politically than they do with people of their own faith tradition who are perhaps less Orthodox or more progressive in their political sensibilities, et cetera, et cetera. And that has been causing some of these religious trends in wider American society. There's a lot of interesting research by um, Dave Campbell and some others that have uh, shown, and this is something that he presents on a lot. It's from his book, American Grace, that he co-authored with uh, Robert Putnam a number of years ago, um, that when of the American religious right and the American political right started to really align in the 1980s, uh, that started sending strong messages then to the rising generation in America saying, this is what religious people are like. Religious people are like conservative Republicans. The two go hand in hand. So you've got a generation that came up in that decade. They're like, huh, well, if being a religious person means being a strong politically conservative Republican, then maybe that's not for me, especially if I've got more liberal sensibilities, politically speaking, et cetera, et cetera. That was a little bit at the time, but it's only gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. So one of his explanations for why we see a decline of the mainline Protestants in America uh, who are more moderate in terms of their theology and political views is because the younger members of those um, faith traditions over the last couple decades have grown up in a world where being religious people means being strongly conservative politically speaking. And there's some evidence, our, the book here is not a direct test of that, like we don't have enough information to be able to get at that, but there's a lot of evidence that fits that theory going on uh, also within the Mormon community, just as it does in American society at large. In a generation where for ever since what, the 50s and the 60s, and then especially with Ezra Taft Benson and getting on into the 1980s and 90s, um, a generation of Mormons growing up in a world where to be a good Mormon means perhaps not be a good Republican, but like definitely support these core Republican Party platforms, then that 
makes an uncomfortable choice for a lot of them. And now we're at a generation where the strongest supporters of President Trump have been the most religious Americans. They're looking at the American landscape and saying, is that the crowd I want to hang out with? Like, are these my people? And that could be one of the contributing factors also within the Mormon community too. That all said, there's different situations uh, present, right? Because uh, early on in the um, Trump campaign, there were a lot of high profile members of the church who were very strongly opposed to Trump's candidacy, et cetera, et cetera. And that all, that was there. And so the Mormon church was sending signals, not officially, but like, this is not something that we're on board with. But then he won. They still voted, the majority of Mormons still voted for President Trump at the end of the day. Um, Clark at inauguration. his inauguration. When President Trump came to Temple Square, the church leadership met with him, as they do with all the presidents, and then publicly thanked him for defending religious freedom. You've got younger, more liberally minded Mormons sitting here saying, but what about that Muslim ban that you talked about? Like, is this what we're going to be thanking him for? And how does this fit with my political sensibilities? And that makes it just, we're talking about like, do you feel at home and comfortable in this community? When those kinds of signals are there, you think, if being a good Mormon means that I've got to do X, Y, and Z, and I can't bring myself to do that, that's also a contributor as well. It's, it's part of the story. Also, it is totally part of the story. There's also <laughs> some interesting research being done about political identity formation. This is the Michelle Margolis book that I read so that was so interesting to me, this model, because essentially we used to believe that our religious affiliation informed our political and voting behavior. So if you were an evangelical Protestant, you would vote for candidates that opposed abortion, for example. Um, now, though, the idea is that the arrow goes in both directions. It's not only that your religious affiliation is driving your political behavior, but your political behavior is driving your religious affiliation, whether you're going to be involved in religion at all, and what religion you will choose if you do choose to be involved. And so, and, and our political identity seems to be formed at an earlier age and, and solidifying at an earlier age than our religious identity now. What that means is that if you have an early adolescent child, for example, and they're in this situation that Ben has described, and maybe their political leanings are to the left, and they see their church veering toward the right and supporting a president that they are, are concerned about, then you might choose, you might privilege the political identity, which is more solid in adolescence now, apparently, than the religious identity, which used to be more solid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, you will make the choice about religion based on how you feel politically. And so in, in reference to your earlier question about what can the church do or not do, this is something that in the United States, which is only one of you know dozens of countries in which the church operates, but in the United States, it wants to think more carefully about its affiliation with the most unpopular president that we've had, you know, the very divisive, polarizing situation, and how it's going to try to navigate that, which is so tricky. Oh, definitely. Well, I just wanted to mention, since you mentioned President Trump, um, I know that President Nelson just met with the uh, is it the Prime Minister of New Jacinda Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, yes. uh, uh, who's a former Mormon who le very publicly left over the LGBT issue. Um, do you see that as an olive branch to the more liberal Mormons that, that he was willing to meet with her? I, it's possible. Um, I think it is pretty standard practice when the, the president of the church travels around to try to have a meeting with a high profile uh, member of the government in whatever country that is. And the fact that she was willing to have that meeting is you know, very wonderful. Her family apparently came and some of them are still active in the church and were present for that meeting. But you know, I, I just wrote a blog post about this because I thought her case is very interesting in that she left the church in her mid-20s specifically because of LGBT issues. She said she at the time had three roommates who were gay and she felt that she was doing them a disservice by continuing to be involved in the church or she was doing the church a disservice by continuing to have them as friends and she chose her friends. And that's not unusual based on what we know in, in the American context of you know some of the choices that millennials are facing religiously and politically. So I suppose with this, 
some might say that, okay, so we're listening to this, and so are you saying that the church then should just stop talking about the issues it cares about, like traditional family or abortion or um, sexuality issues? That's one possible suggestion. I don't think that's going to be the case, but could they give equal weight to the issues that younger members or more progressive leading members tend to care about? Could we see just as many talks in general conference addressing things like poverty or creation care or caring for the stranger just as often as we hear traditional family um, sexuality issues and things like that? That might be a way to send stronger signals that we do have values and we care a lot about them, but this is a place where we're going to be asking people on a lot of these values that, that our church believes in. It's a disproportionate emphasis, I think. That's something that the church could do to that's a very good yeah. point. And you know, since the, the beginnings of the correlation movement, there's been a drive in the Quorum of the Twelve to present a united front at all times to the world. That We have one unified message. There is no division among the brethren. That actually can be problematic for younger people um, because if they knew that there was a Hugh B. Brown, for example, who was voting Democrat and open about it, and you know that that was more liberal leaning on some issues. Even just having two or three people in the quorum of the twelve that they knew agreed with them politically, even if it didn't have to be everyone, would be healthier mm -hmm. than Elderly hiding folks. that. Right? <laughs> we don't know though, and I, he, I don't think votes in America, does he? <laughs> um, uh, that's a good question. He, I, don't I know. think he's got. Does he I have, have to look I, I don't know. Gonna, yeah. okay, that's a great question. Yeah. We would love to claim him. You know, he's <laughs> he's so awesome. But um, but to to be more open about disagreements within the quorum of the twelve would help the church actually in modeling how do you have a healthier congregation where people don't always feel the same way, but we are still united in being the church of Jesus Christ. If, if we're not having that message that unity is not necessarily uniformity coming from the top, it's really hard to know how to, how to do it at the grassroots level. Well, and I, I, since you mentioned that, I know Matt Harris uh, has done a lot of work, uh, especially on Hubie Brown and Ezra Taft Benson. And the, I know that in the 60s especially, those two kind of went head to head. In Chalk and cheese, buddy. Chalk and cheese. <laughs> and the, the church felt like, well, we're not unified. This is a problem. So I think they've really tried to overcome those. Um, and and I, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> you solve one problem, you create another, it seems like. And that sort of thing. So. I suppose that's the exact okay. same thing that religious organizations through human history have been dealing with, right? Just in terms of... Uh, how much diversity do you allow for before schisms happen, mm -hmm. and how to get the optimal tension between those? And that's, I mean, that's something that's that like, Armin uh, Moss, Moss has talked about, exactly. right? Exactly. Is like how do we manage that? And different faith traditions have gone in different directions on that. That's a difficult question, yeah. yeah. Because you're right. There's, there's, there's so far been no perfect solution ever found in the history of the world. Well, and yeah. I, I just want to mention Greg Prince. I talked to him this weekend, and he says the, the Methodist Church is really struggling with LGBT, and they were giving him a hard time when the November policy came out, and then he just said they're, the, the Methodist Church is talking about schism over LGBT, and, and uh, I know that somebody said uh, to Greg, um, I never thought that we'd make the Mormons look progressive. <laughs> so, and I know these, these are hard. You know, we, on my podcast, that we focus on Mormons because I'm a Mormon and, and that's what I'm interested in. But I think these are hard issues for people of all faiths, of, you know, the Methodists, the, the Lutherans, the Baptists. Everybody's struggling with these same sort of issues. And um, I, I think your research is just awesome. And, and I'm really, it was a fun read. I really Thank enjoyed you. reading the book. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Reese and Dr. Knoll. You know, our next conversation will be our last one with them. And I'm going to be giving away this copy of The Next Mormons to one of my newsletter subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed yet, here's your last chance. Go to gospeltangents.com slash newsletter and you'll be entered to win this copy of The Next Mormons. I'll be giving that away in our next episode. So don't miss out. Enter right away. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about what Jana and Ben think church leaders should know with regards to research in their book. You have to have equal representation of women. 
You cannot continue having meetings in which decisions are made that affect women's lives directly without a woman in the room, at least one woman in the room. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.